everyone's way. And over to you, Dean. Okay, thank you. So you're all very, very welcome. Um, this webinar series that we've put together is uh, in recognition of the 50th anniversary of the UNESCO Man in Biosphere program. Um, and I, I want to say a massive thank you to um, Eleanor and Joe, uh, my fellow biosphere coordinators there, um, for their efforts in bringing this together. There are other thank yous. I'm going to get on with it in a bit. Um, but uh, Eleanor, you're, you're next on my screen. So I'm going to hand you, you want to tell us a little bit about your biosphere before I crack on? Yeah, of course. Thanks, Dean. So my name's Eleanor Turner and I am the biosphere officer working down in the Kerry Biosphere Reserve down in Southwest Ireland for anyone who's not familiar with the geography of Ireland. Um, we are actually a landlocked biosphere, which is quite interesting considering Kerry has one of the longest coastlines in, the, in all of Ireland. Um, but we have such amazing habitats and species here. The core area of our biosphere reserve is Clarny National Park, which has Ireland's only native uh, red deer herd and a, a myriad of other species and oak woodlands and really beautiful features. Uh, we also have Ireland's largest mountain, Carron Tool, right in the centre of our biosphere reserve too. So really significant places. And uh, I suppose the people here in Kerry, I'm from Kerry, so I'm a bit biased anyways, but it's always very warm, really community driven work. So I'm absolutely delighted to be in the position and working with the Biosphere Reserve down here. Uh, and also delighted to be working with Dean and Joe in the, the, the world network of Biosphere Reserves and able to deliver a webinar series like this with them. Thank you, Eleanor. Um, so Joe, will you tell us a little bit about yourself and the Isle of Man? Yeah, hi, first of all, in Manx Gaelic, everybody. Um, it's great to see so many people from the Isle of Man on the webinar today, actually, and um, also to meet so many new people from Dublin Bay, where I had the pleasure of spending a bit of time in 2019 for Euromab and also Kerry. So hello to you all. Um, I think for us, one of the great joys of being a biosphere is the, that ability that we have to collaborate and collaborate with each other and learn from each other. Um, we're obviously close neighbours, we're obviously proud Celtic nations together and we have a lot in common, I think. Um, but we also have a lot that sort of separates us and a lot of strands of work that we're doing individually. Um, and I think for our biosphere, um, we've been UNESCO Biosphere since 2016. Um, we are very much looking forward to um, working with you in the year ahead to share some of our stories and to find out a little bit more about some of our closest neighbour biospheres. So thank you very much for um, inviting us onto this webinar series and we look forward to delivering our own webinars as the year goes on. So, And we can't wait to find out a little bit more about your iconic Brent geese and your other bird life. So. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Joe. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, I, I, there's there's an, another thank you I want to uh, uh, put out there, and that's to the NPWS National Parks and Wildlife Service. Um, they've kindly supported this uh, collaboration. Um, uh, they've uh, secured the license for the uh, the Zoom license uh, for these webinars. Um, so that's very very grateful. So I appreciate. Uh, them doing that and obviously Birdwatch Ireland who have put in a huge amount of effort pulling all this information together and we have Tara who I'm going to be handing over to in a bit and we've also Ricky who's out in the field so we're actually going to see um, some of Dublin Bay firsthand which is quite amazing and uh, a little bit scary I have to admit um, but fingers crossed everything will work so I'm just going to crack on I'm going to talk a little bit about um, uh, the Dublin Bay Biosphere and the uh, UNESCO programme so now, <laughs> there we go. Oh, um, so there's a great image of the Dublin Bay Biosphere. You've got the river, river Liffey flowing through Dublin City. Um, so obviously Dublin City is the capital of Ireland um, and the, the Liffey flows out into, into Dublin Bay. Um, we're not unique but we're quite rare in the fact that we have a capital city at the centre of our biosphere. Um, to the top left hand corner there you've got uh, Hoth Head and just in front of Hoth Head you've got North Bell Island um, and over to the right hand side you have Dunleary uh, you can just about see the harbour there and behind that you have Dorky Island um, and that encompasses the majority of the biosphere. Um, we have 330,000 people living within um, the Dublin Bay biosphere um, in our, our transition zone so um, you know it's great that we're able to engage and work with them. So just a couple of images, particularly for those who are not from Dublin, and, um, and obviously quite a few of you are. Uh, we've got a great image there of Collymore Harbour on the, on the top left hand side, looking out to Dorky with the Martello Tower on the island. On the top right hand side you have Hoth, 
uh, harbour, great little image um, there of uh, some of the fishing boats and the sailing boats. On the bottom left you have um, Dunleary Harbour um, and the bandstand and on the bottom right you have another image there of North Bell Island. So, you know, what is a biosphere? I mean, biospheres are internationally recognised for their biodiversity. Um, they're important sites for nature conservation. Um, it's a designation by UNESCO um, and it was launched in 1971. Um, the programme was first muted in 1970, but it was officially launched in November 1971. And there are currently 714 biospheres in 129 states. Um, so we're part of a really big, fantastic network um, where, we, you know, where we can learn and share ideas with each other. Um, so the UNESCO Biosphere goes, uh, the primary goal is conservation. We have to have something obviously worth protecting. Um, but also um, biospheres are about sustainable development. So we're supporting the local economy, people who work within the biosphere. Um, that's primarily um, adventure tourism providers but not wholly um, and then there's the learning and uh, learning element so we need to understand what's happening in our biosphere so that we can manage them properly but we also need to share that knowledge and that's part of what this uh, presentation today is all about um, so a little bit about the Dublin Bay Biosphere Vision, I'll read it to you there. Uh, it's to celebrate and promote a wider appreciation of the natural and cultural heritage of Dublin Bay, to capture the inherent passion of the community for the biosphere concept and for the Dublin Bay Biosphere to be an example of a, a new wave of biospheres in the World Network. And we're certainly hoping that we'll have some more um, Irish biospheres in the near future. Um, a second part of the vision is um, the Bimbley Bay Biosphere will be recognised and valued as a place where people, nature and culture connect and where residents, visitors and businesses directly contribute to the conservation of their natural, cultural and built heritage through everyday actions. The Biosphere will support a strong local economy based on ecotourism and responsible recreation, where statutory NGO business, community and environmental stakeholders work in partnership for a sustainable future. Um, yeah, the whole purpose of this is people and nature connecting and that can bring its own challenges and I think that's something that will be covered during the next presentation. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to stop talking and I'm going to hand you over to Tara. So Tara, it's Hi. all yours. Thanks William. Sorry, just give me two seconds. Just can't. Okay, hi, can everybody hear me okay? Or, yeah. <laughs> okay, so my name is Tara Adcock. I work for Birdwatch Ireland. Um, and part of my role with Birdwatch Ireland is working on the Dublin Bay Birds Project team. So I work with Ricky Whelan, who's just here on the left, and Helen Boland, who's the project manager. Um, you'll be meeting Ricky Whelan a little bit later on in the show. Um, so the Dublin Bay Birds Project is lucky enough to be funded by Dublin Port Company and we're very grateful to be given this opportunity today to talk about the Dublin Bay Biosphere and core Dublin Bay area. Okay, so what I'll be talking about is Dublin Bay Biosphere, um, an overview of the main species at, the, at three sites in the Dublin Bay Biosphere. So these are Baldoyle Estuary, Ireland's Eye and the Dalky Islands like Dean has just mentioned. Um, I'll be talking a little bit about what makes Dublin Bay unique and I'll give an overview of the waterbird species in Dublin Bay and some of the pressures that are on the Dublin Bay ecosystem. Okay, so there are six key sites in um, the Dublin Bay biosphere that are really important in terms of the wildlife that they contain. But they're also really important sites um, for people to get involved um, with wildlife and to get a really good grasp of what wildlife is, what wildlife is present in the bay. So these are Baldoyle Estuary, just up here um, at the northern end. It's about 11 kilometres from, from Dublin city centre, so it just shows how central everything is in Dublin Bay. Sorry. Uh, we have Ireland's Eye, which is just an island just up here, um, and it has a really important seabird colony. And we have Dalky Island just down to the south here, just at the southern tip of the bay. And then here in kind of what we'd call the core Dublin Bay area, we have North Bull Island, Falca Estuary and the South Dublin Bay. Okay, so the Baldoyle Estuary um, is a, a, sorry, the Baldoyle Estuary is a really important um, estuary just in the northern part of the bay of the biosphere. It um, supports 1% or more of the world's population of Brent, uh, sorry, Brent, light-bellied Brent geese. 
um, which means that it's internationally important site for this species. The reason that the light belly branchies are in Baldoil estuary is all because of this plant here. It's called eelgrass and it's their preferred prey species, it's their preferred species to their preferred plant to eat. Sorry. Um, when this runs out as it does over the winter, they'll then move on to playing pitches. So for instance, you can see Port Marnock golf course here. This will be full of branch geese and there's other green spaces in the bay as well. Um, Baldur Lethry is also important for five other species. Um, so nationally important levels of these species occur here. So this means that 1% or more of Ireland's population of these species actually occur in Baldoyle estuary um, during the winter months. So these species are shell duck, bar-tailed godwit, grey plover, golden plover and ringed plover. And ringed plover are arguably the cutest of the um, wading birds in Dublin Bay. Moving over to Ireland's eye, we, this is a really important seabird colony. So the largest of the seabirds on Ireland's eye is the gannet, and it, weigh, it has a wingspan of two metres, making it the largest seabird on the island. This bird is incredibly amazing. Um, it's really well designed for its um, plunge diving technique that it uses. Um, so basically it has a, a built-in crash helmet in its head, um, because the bones in the head, in the skull, are so thick that when it dives into the water at 100 kilometers per hour, it actually uh, protects it and makes sure that it doesn't, it doesn't break its head. It also has air sacs in its throat, which allows it to protect its, its neck as well. It can also see fish from a, a height of 40 meters above the water. The next species on the side is the black-tailed, is the black-legged kittiwake. Um, this is the smallest of the gulls. And it's the only gull that's truly pelagic, i.e. it lives out at sea for its um, outside of the breeding season. So it's completely at sea during um, outside the breeding season. The third species we have is the fulmer. Um, fulmers arrived into Ireland in about 1911 and it's thought that they came here following ships from Wales. The way that fulmer hunts is really interesting because it can smell its prey. So it can smell plankton, it can smell other species um, and it just follows its nose along. Um, the third, the third species we have is the razorbill. So razorbills, black common guillemots, and puffins are all part of the auk family. Um, razorbills and common guillemots have a really interesting parental strategy. So the fathers actually take off with the young um, after a couple of weeks once the chicks have left the nesting colony, and they will go out to sea with them, and uh, they'll go out to sea with them and teach them how to fish while the mother gets to take it easy. So she just leaves completely. Puffins, on the other hand, have a bit more of a tough love approach. So after a few weeks, uh, to a couple of months, they just abandon the young in the burrow and the young have to make their own way out to sea and learn how to do everything on their own. The final species that we have are the shag and the cormorant. So these two species look remarkably similar, but there are some key differences. So first off, the shag is a lot smaller um, it has a glossier appearance overall, particularly during the breeding season. And during the breeding season, it has this crest here, and it also has this yellow gape. In comparison, we have the cormorant, which is a bit duller overall. It has a white gape around the mouth, um, and it's, just, it's, a, it's a lot bigger as well. So those are the species of Ireland's eye. Sorry, this used to have frozen on me. There we go. Um, this is just a video of a shag swimming in the water. You can, just, you can see just how comfortable and fish-like they are in the water. Okay, so down in the southern portion of the Dublin Bay biosphere is Dalky Island. Um, so Dalky Island is home to a really important tern colony. It's mainly made up of Arctic terns, which are this, this species here, um, but there are a few common terns on the colony as well. And up until 2016, we had small numbers of rosier terns. There's only one pair in 2016, but since then, they actually haven't been breeding on the island. And Birdwatch Ireland, um, in partnership with Dunleary Redown County Council and in the past with the EU Life Project, has been working really hard to try and get the rosier tern to come back to the island. I'll be talking a little bit more about terns later on and I'll go into the IDing of them then. 
Okay, so in, in Dublin, when we're talking about Dublin Bay, what we're typically talking about isn't the biosphere as a whole, but this core area, this core area here. So seen from Sutton at the north, down to Dunleary, down here at the south. So when I'm talking about Dublin Bay from now on, I won't be talking about the biosphere as a whole, I'll be talking about this core area. So the species that I'll be talking about will be occurring in this area here. They do occur in Baldoyle Estuary as well, but I'll be talking specifically about the ones that are in this area. So Dublin Bay, as we're, as we're referring to it now, is composed of, um, of three core areas. This is North Bull Island up here to the north. This is the Talca Estuary and South Dublin Bay. But what makes this portion of Dublin Bay so special? First off, it's a wetland ecosystem. So a wetland is an area that is covered by shallow water either all or some of the time. And it's really important for water birds. These are birds which wade or swim in water and are dependent upon water for their survival, i.e. for food. Um, globally, we're losing wetlands three times faster than forests, which makes Dublin Bay all the more important to protect. And it makes it all the more special, both on a national and also on a global scale. It's one of the top five water bird sites in Ireland. So consistently, um, Dublin Bay is turning up in the, as one of the top five water bird sites in Ireland. Um, and the reason for this is because of the huge amounts of birds that we get in the bay over the winter. The average is about 29,000 um, per year. Because of the huge numbers of birds that actually overwinter in Dublin Bay, Dublin Bay is now designated as an EU Special Protection Area for birds. The importance of this is that it means that Ireland has a legal obligation to protect this site, which is really important. The location of Dublin Bay also makes it quite unique. There are several estuaries close by, for example, Baldoyle and Rogerstown estuaries. We've already come across Baldoyle estuary. Also, its setting is quite unique. Um, it has 1.5 million people on its doorstep. Um, Dublin Bay, the Dublin Bay biosphere as a whole is the only biosphere in Europe that's set within a capital city, which is, is quite phenomenal. It also has a large port at its core. Later on in the presentation, we're going to talk a little bit about the pressures that come with having a port, at, uh, having a port and a really large urban population. Bangs straight in the middle of all of this wildlife. Um, but for now, we're just going to move on to the other parts to make it special. So it's an important, Dublin Bay is an important breeding area for terns during the summer months. These birds are actually breeding here. They're breeding on man-made structures in the port. And finally, there's a mosaic of habitats in the bay. And this is really important for having a good diversity of species. So for instance, we have the mudflats just here, so of North Bull Island, and also down in Booterstown Marsh and the Talca Estuary. These are basically just giant fridges and um, they're just areas where uh, there's lots of food for birds to feed and there's a lot of species which depend upon these. We also have the sand flats here of Dolly Mount um, Strand and also Sandy Mount Strand. The, the importance of having this diversity is best seen when we look at um, two species. So there's, there's two species that are closely related that I'll, that I'll give some details on later, but one of them uses the sand flats just here, and its cousin uses the mud flats. There's also salt marsh just in North Bull Island, just here, and in Buddhistown Strand, which is down, Buddhistown Marsh, which is just down here. This is really important um, for birds that are roosting up. Roosting just simply means resting. Um, these areas provide a safe place for them to rest and regains energy lost when they're commuting or foraging, and it's really important that we don't disturb them at these sites. Um, finally, we have playing pitches. Dublin is quite unique in that there's a lot of green space in it and these playing pitches are really important for species like brent geese which rely on them um, when the eelgrass turns out. And we have man-made habitats uh, such as in the port and these are really important for breeding birds. But now I'm going to hand you over to Ricky Whelan who is standing somewhere around where this red dot is and he's going to give you an overview of the bay. Okay over to you Ricky. <laughs> Hello everyone. Um, I don't know if you can see me. Can 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 everyone see me, Tara? Um, I can only see myself there. Yeah, I can see you. Okay, good, good, good. Well, um, so yeah, I'm Ricky. Um, I'm on Bull Island, as as Tara said. So, um, I'm stood uh, on the point where Tara showed you on the map, which is at on the just at the tip of the wooden bridge is the access to 
Two Bull Island. Um, it's quite an interesting place. I started working with the Dublin Bay Birds Project in January 2014, and this is where I parked the first day to start my field work. So it's a, it's a place I'm very familiar with. Um, just to show you, I'm just going to um, change the direction of my screen to just show you what, what I'm looking at, um, just to give you some give you some context. Now, so the tide is still very high, so there's no birds about. There's a few turnstones just down here, um, lovely little birds and so called because they, they basically turn stones and any debris they can find to find little creatures and crustaceans and things to eat. So I don't know if you can see them down there, but um, really this is is fairly typical. You can see Clintarf down this way, that's the wooden bridge. And you can see what's uh, as the tide drops, the mud flats and the sand emerging. And in the distance there to the right hand side, that paler color habitat, that's the salt marsh, a really important habitat too. And to, to the right of that, you've got um, the sand dune system, which um, there's actually a golf course built there. So it's um, quite interesting. There's two golf courses um, on Bull Island. Um, it's part of it. So Bull Island actually formed in the, it, after the, the, I'm just flipping around there. Bull Island formed in the, after the, the river walls were built in the 1700s to stop sand and silt building back up in the port channel. Um, and what happened after that was, as the sand and silt was dumped out further out in the Irish Sea, it was coming back in with tidal action and it was beginning to form and um, deposit and collect behind the north wall. And it began, it, it developed into an embryonic dune system, the sand built up, and now you have an island which is five miles long or five kilometers long and nearly a kilometer uh, wide at its at its widest point. So it's, it's quite, um, quite a significant um, you know a piece of piece of ground and why the birds are here and why they like it so much is you've got everything they need really you've got um, the protection from the sea and the worst of the storms the, the, the island actually gives that physical barrier um, and also you've got some brilliant habitats full of food and um, like they're, they, all the invertebrates the crustaceans the worms all the things that water birds and waders swans geese herons ducks you name it like so it's um, quite a good place to be. And then, because we're in the middle of a, of a capital city, it affords them even further protection because there's no guys out with shotguns and rifles uh, hunting them, thankfully. So it's, um, you know, the birds really have, have all their, their bases covered here. So on an average day, 25, 30 species of water bird could be easily recorded in this lagoon in front of me. And just a few brain geese flying across there. I don't know if you can see those. Very hard to give you meaningful views with the phone, but... um. In the distance, you've got some gulls roosting, and hopefully later on, potentially, um, towards the end of the the presentation, I might ask Dean to see if he can come back to me. I'll sit tight here, and if the tide is dropped, I might be able to show you some waders uh, and things closer up. So I'm just going to turn around and just show you context how close we are to the city and just how busy it is here. So if you can see in the distance there. Uh, in the cr the cranes are in distance. Sorry, I'll straighten this up. In the very distance there, you can see a pile of, of of cranes, and that's like that's the middle of the city centre. So that's only a few miles from here. What we're looking straight into there is is the Talca, and um, the Talca Estuary, where the Talc the River Talca comes out from town, um, and it meets the Liffey just here to the left. So you can see those towers. They're pitted cool bag towers, and um, it's an old disused uh, power plant, and um. Right there where the smoke or the, the vapour is coming out of those chimneys is the middle of Dublin Port. So the, the, we're dead centre in the middle of, a, or Dublin Port is dead centre in the middle of some really, really uni brilliant habitats uh, and some really busy, busy areas for birds. So <clears throat> as Tara mentioned, on average 30,000 water birds using, using the bay uh, in the winter. So it's, there's a lot going on here. Uh, I don't know if you can see those kayakers as well. So there's a range of uses. You can see how busy it is here with walkers today. So there is a level of disturbance. The birds have adapted to too. So and Tara's going to hit on that a bit more later. But um, for now, I just wanted to give you the context, show you the sights, um, and maybe later show you a few more birds. We'll see if that'll work or not. So I'm going to go back to go back to Tara now.
Hi, sorry, my screen has just stopped working <laughs> again. There you go. I'll leave my screen up to get sorted. Thanks a million. Seamless. Okay, there we go. Just have it. I don't know if you can see in the distance. I'll keep talking until you get sorted, Tara. Nice. Yeah, um, got some mute swans o over there, which everyone will be familiar with. Sort of our biggest water bird. And also, feeding in front of them, you won't see them because they're so tiny. They're smallest water bird. Uh, the little grebe, which dive in. They're very hard to sometimes locate because just as you're about to put your binoculars on them or get your eyes on them, they dive down looking for small fish and crustaceans and things. Um, they're, so it's good to see the biggest and the smallest water birds here today. I'm really hopeful now we'll have, have more birds later on and um, um, it's good so. Thanks Ricky, I'm, I'm back in again. So. Alright, excellent. Thanks okay. so. Okay, thanks Lillian. Um, so some of the habitats, I'll just give a quick recap, some of the habitats that Ricky could see there. Um, these are the salt, this is the salt marsh that Ricky was talking about on North Bull Island. So this is the South Lagoon of North Bull Island. Um, this is the Talca Estuary. So this is really important um, at low tide as the tide comes out. As you can see there, as Ricky was saying, the tide is still in a little bit. So those, those areas look quite devoid of birds, apart from the turnstone. But at low tide, there are just like, there's just thousands of birds out on, on these mud flats here. Um, we're going to, uh, some of the birds that Ricky will, would see, will see when the tide comes out um, are these species here. So these are international, this, these are species that there's internationally important numbers of in Dublin Bay. So this means that in some or all years, 1% or more of the world's populations of these species are present in Dublin Bay. So the four species are red knot, this bird here, light-bellied brent goose, who we've al already met, bar-tailed godwit, and black-tailed godwit. So the red knot looks completely different during the breeding season um, compared to during the um, non-breeding season when we see it here in Ireland. During the breeding season it has this beautiful red brick plumage and both male and female have this plumage which is quite unusual. Um, the, red knot, uh, the red knot also gets its name from the colour during the breeding season. Um, so the red knot breeds in Greenland and northern Canada. Um, Pre-migration, it essentially self-cannibalizes, so it reduces down the size of its digestive organs to make space for its flight muscles and its heart that'll power it the whole way up to, to Greenland, up to the Arctic region. Um, large numbers arrive in Dublin Bay in November and most have left by April. So by April, you'll, you'll start to see them a little bit of red brick on them, so you get just a glimpse of what they look like during the breeding season. Now they're found in both North and South Dublin Bay, but if you're really, really desperate to see red knot, the place I'd recommend is basically where Ricky is standing now. It's in Dublin, it's in the North Bull Island, um, in the South Lagoon there. If you just hop onto that wooden bridge and take a look out, as the tide is falling, you'll see them coming out onto those mud flats and feeding. And it's really quite spectacular. You actually get thousands of these birds there. They gather in really tightly packed flocks, often thousands, during the winter, just, and this is just a strategy to keep warm. So just have a think to yourselves, how many birds do you think would be within this red dot, within this red circle? I'll just give you a minute just to have a quick think about it. Okay, so if we zoom in on that red dot, you can actually see that every bird with a red dot on its head is what we're looking at. That's 100 birds. So that 100 birds is packed in that little spot there and it just shows just how densely packed in these species are and just what a good method it is for keeping warm. It's also an absolute nightmare for counting but that's that's aside from anything else. Okay, so coming on to the light-bellied brent goose. So this is definitely Ireland's favourite goose. Um, they're an absolutely amazing species, and they breed up in northeast, up in the northeastern Canadian Arctic, and they stop off in Iceland to feed. So this is a ring recovery. So basically, put these rings onto their legs, and they're uniquely inscribed. And somebody read it down here on the east coast of Ireland, and then it was recited up here in the northeastern Canada. And it's just a really good way for us to understand what areas are important for these birds. 
Now, approximately 95% of the world's population of light bellied Frankies overwinter in Ireland, which places a lot of responsibility on our shoulders to, to protect this really charismatic species. The light bellied Frankies, as we've already mentioned, feeds on eelgrass, and when this runs out, they move on to playing pitches. Um, so those green spaces in Dublin Bay in Dublin are really important for this species. Um, in Dublin Bay, through counts that the Dublin Bay Birds Project has carried out, we found that the majority of these birds can actually be found at North Bull Island in Dublin Bay North. And the reason that they can be found there is because of the presence of eelgrass. There's just a lot more eelgrass in Dublin, in North Bull Island, than there would be in, say, for instance, the Talca Estuary or on Sandy Mount Strand. So that's why they're present there in such high concentrations. These birds actually really defy um, expectations. You would think that a species that breeds the whole way up here where there's absolutely no people would be really shy of, of people, that they'd keep their distance. But no, they kind of just get on with it. They've habituated to our presence. Um, so this is a really nice photograph of Brent geese um, in Dublin port just feeding on the grain that's fallen from the silos that are coming in on the ships. And there's just absolutely no bother on them whatsoever. Another species that occurs in Dublin Bay in internationally important numbers is the bar godwit. Again, very much like the knot, it looks completely different um, when it's in its breeding plumage than it does when it's here with us in Ireland during the winter. If you go out in July though, when these birds are coming in from the Norwegian Arctic Circle, you will actually see them kind of still with a lot of the vestiges or sometimes fully clad in this um, really red brick beautiful plumage and it's well worth a visit. Um, many of the, so basically from the colouring recitings that I mentioned earlier, so this is a colouring here and that's the inscription, it's DH, from these colouring, um, from people just seeing these colourings, we actually know that a lot of the Dublin Bay Bartel Godwit stop over at the Wadden Sea in the Netherlands. This is an incredible spot. Um, over the space of one year, it can, it can have up to 12 million birds either breeding, overwintering or passing through. So if you're into birding and you want to see an amazing, spectacular site, I would highly recommend going to the Wadden Sea in the Netherlands. There is um, a cousin of the bartail godwit, it's a subspecies of bartail godwit that breeds in Alaska and overwinters in Australia and New Zealand. So obviously we don't get this subspecies in Ireland, but it has the longest, longest non-stop migration of any bird species. It's not the longest migration of any bird species, but the longest non-stop migration of any bird species. And it travels 10 to 11,000 kilometers from Alaska down to Australia and New Zealand non-stop. And like the red knot, it also self-cannibalizes. So it reduces its digestive organs and increases the size of its heart and its flight muscles just to make that epic journey. So these are a really incredible bird. I think they weigh about 300 grams. So like less than half a bag of sugar and it can fly that, that kind of distance non-stop. It's amazing. Um, its cousin is the black tail goddard. Um, so it breeds in Iceland and the males are actually smaller than the females, which is really interesting. In Dublin Bay, it's usually found in the northern part of Bull Island and in Booterstown Strand as it likes muddier habitat and it feeds on playing pitches. So if you go up to any of the playing pitches alongside the Brent geese, you'll often see these black-tailed godwits. Um, these species, the bar-tailed godwit and the black-tailed godwit, during the winter they look ridiculously similar um, until you get the eye in. So I just thought I'd give a quick breakdown of the difference between them. So the um, black-tailed godwit has quite a plain brown back and has really long neck legs. So between the knee joint here and where the leg meets the belly is really long. And this is in comparison to the black-tailed godwit, which has a short little stumpy um, bit in between the knee joint and the belly and a scalloped pattern on the back. With these two species it's really all about getting the eye in, just getting out there and watching them and I guarantee you you'll get loads of enjoyment out of them because they're, they're quite big characters as well. Um, in flight they're actually a lot easier to, to ID. So the Bartel godwit um, has quite a plain um, scalloped pattern on its back um, whereas the black-tailed godwit has this lovely white stripe on its wings and this wedge shape, black wedge shape on its tail. And this is where it gets its name from. And just above the tail, you can see this white rump. It's a really characteristic, um, like really characteristic of black-tailed godwits in flight. So if you're out and about in Dublin Bay and you want to see these species, first off, if you're looking for black-tailed godwits, which are represented by yellow, 
I would go to North Bull Island, particularly the northern part of North Bull Island, what's known as the North Lagoon, and they occur in quite big numbers there. Talca Estuary might get better views down here because it's closer to the wall. So you get quite a number of them feeding down here at low tide or on a falling tide. Then you also quite curiously get them on Dolly Mount Strand just beside the, the bull wall there. So if you're walking along the bull wall just here and you look out with your binoculars, you'll be able to see them foraging in around there. On the south side of Dublin Bay, you'll get them down at Booterstown Marsh. So there's a nice mucky marshy area that they like. So they really like muddy habitats. That's where their food, that's where the food that they prefer lives. If you're looking for bar-tail godwits, go to the South Lagoon where Ricky is at the minute and you'll see them foraging there at low tide and also roosting up in this salt marsh here. You'll get them on the far side of, um, of the bull wall there in the Talca estuary. And the reason that they're, they're here, and sorry, you'll get them in Dollyman Strand on the sandier mud flats and on Sandyman Strand. So bar-tail godwits, unlike black-tail godwits, like really sandy substrates, like really sandy habitats. So that's why you get them on beaches like here and here and in kind of slightly sandier habitats like here. Bull Island also, or not Bull Island rather, sorry, um, the Dublin Bay also has nationally important numbers of several species. So again, this just means that 1% or more of the population of these species in Ireland um, can be found at these sites uh, in Dublin Bay. So first species we have up is the oyster catcher. So this is the oyster catcher here. And then we also have golden plover. So, so oyster catcher, um, unlike its name, its, its name is actually a bit of a lie. Um, oyster catchers don't eat oysters. What they eat are muscle, mussels, cockles, worms, and clams. And the beak of an oyster catcher is shaped by the way it feeds. So hammers, like this guy, they feed on mussels, cockles, and have a shorter, blunter bill. Just from hammering it in, the bill gets worn out over time. And the other, other feeding type, so they, we have what's called probers, and they feed on worms and clams and have longer, pointier bills. So this is just a video of an oyster catcher feeding. And as you're watching it, just keep an eye on the bill. It's a really long, pointed bill. Um, and I'll just play it for you now. So you can see the oyster catcher has a clam and see his long pointed beak. So that beak is long pointed because he's just sticking it into the mud all the time. He's not having to hammer it against anything hard. And so his beak is able to stay like nice and long and pointed. Okay, so we've been coloring um, oyster catchers in Dublin Bay and they get three colorings. Um, and one of these has a unique code. So you can see this bird here is called Ivy and this allows individual identification of the birds. The purpose of this is to understand the sites that these birds rely on, both in Ireland and abroad, and how, how long they live and where they're breeding. So this is really important if we're going to conserve these species. During the breeding season, um, we have found that, oyster, that there's really strong connections between oyster catchers that overwinter in Dublin Bay and um, breed up in Iceland and Scotland. So most of our observations of breeding oyster catchers have come from these two spots. And you can see a real Scottish-English um, divide. So we only actually have two resightings of oyster catchers breeding in Ireland, in England. Most of them like to come from Scotland and Iceland. Sorry, yeah. Another species which occurs in nationally important numbers in um, Dublin Bay is this absolutely beautiful bird, the golden plover. So the golden plover breeds in Iceland, Scotland, and in the west and northwest of Ireland. Um, we get summer visitors from France and Iberia. And in flight, this bird performs these beautiful starling-like murmurations. And I have a video now just to show you that. that the birds are going to start circling now is an anti-predator defence. Essentially, if a peregrine falcon is chasing them, they can be swooping and diving and it confuses the peregrine falcon and it mightn't be able to pick out one. Also, they occur in these really, really big numbers because the more of them there are, the less likely they are to one of them is to get picked off.
So if you're looking for golden plovers, the best places in Dublin Bay to um, see them are again, are again, North Bull Island um, down here in the south again, and the Talca Estuary and down at Marion Gates, you get big, big uh, groups of them resting up at Marion Gates. Um, so the red shank and the curly also occur in nationally important numbers. So this is a red shank and this is a curly. Okay, so the curly breeds in Europe and Western Siberia. It's the largest wading bird in Europe. Um, in Ireland, it is a breeding species in Ireland, but it has been in decline since the 1980s. And a lot of this is to do with um, intensification of agriculture. So currently we have 123 breeding pairs in Ireland. During the winter, we get a lot of curlew coming in from Europe. So you'll notice that um, you'll see a lot of curlew around Dublin Bay, but these aren't Irish breeding curlew. These, are, these aren't just curlew breeding in Ireland. These are also curlew that are breeding around Europe. And this species is found right across Dublin Bay. Um, so red shank, these lovely little orange legged guys here, um, they breed in Ireland, England, Scotland and Iceland. And they're passage migrants from Scandinavia and the Baltic region. Um, they're affectionately and sometimes not so affectionately um, called the Warden of the Marsh. Basically these birds scare at the drop of a hat and when they rise up they start calling and they scare everything else up which is an absolute pain when you're trying to count them. Um, but they're great little birds and they're basically the Duracell bunnies of the wading world. They never stop. Um, they never stop moving. They always seem to be on the go. Um, this species is found right across Dublin Bay, anywhere you go. In Dublin Bay, you should, you should eventually see a red shank. Okay, moving on to our ducks and our, our moving on to ducks, and we have nationally important numbers of some of these as well. So in summer, all years, 1% or more of our population of widgeon, teal and shell duck, so widgeon, teal and shell duck, um, are in Dublin Bay, which is quite incredible. Okay, so shell duck um, breeds in Ireland. It's quite unusual because it breeds in holes and banks in trees and in rabbit burrows. Um, so if you're out on Docky Island, uh, which is part of the biosphere, there's shell duck that breed out there and they go out down into the rabbit burrows and lay their eggs, raise their chicks, and then they'll, um, they'll swim across with them across the sound. So they'll swim across the sea and bring them over to dry land that way. Um, birds from Scandinavia and the Baltics overwinter in Ireland as well. So our, the population gets bolstered during the, during the winter um, with those birds. Okay, so this is a widgeon, this is the male, and this is the female. So I should have said back here, both the male and female shell duck look exactly the same. And this probably has something to do with the fact that they are in like holes in trees or in rabbit burrows. They don't need to camouflage in. Whereas this species here, the widgeon, she, this girl here, she has to um, hide away from any potential predators. So if she can blend in with the rest of her environment, with the grass and stuff around her, then a predator such as a fox um, won't be able to detect the nest as easily. Um, so widgeon overwinter in Ireland, um, widgeon that overwinter in Ireland breed in Iceland and their diet consists of eelgrass, sea lettuce, um, and then they'll eat insects and mollusks during the summer. Um, this is teal, so it's a tiny little uh, duck, it's really cute. Uh, male and female again look quite different, the female is quite plain. And again, this is for the same reason, it's just so that the nest doesn't get detected. Um, the birds, again, that overwinter in Ireland uh, breed in Iceland. And they uh, eat a lot of seeds, vegetation and mollusks. So if you're looking for, basically, if you're looking for ducks in Dublin Bay, Bull Island is your spot. This is where you'll find um, It's Duck Central. Um, finally, in the finally, we have the Dublin Port Tern Colony. Dublin Port Tern Colony is really fantastic. So, um, there's around 600 breeding pairs on the island, or on sorry, there's around 600 breeding pairs um, in the Dublin Port Tern Colony, and they are all on man-made structures within the port. Um, I'm just going to show you a quick video of what it's like to approach these these uh, these colonies, and just note that we are approaching them and going on to them because we're, we're working there. We minimize the amount of time that we're there and we're very careful while we are on these, on these colonies.
What you would have heard there are mostly common terms. There's around 600 breeding pairs, but um, sorry, so there's around 600 breeding pairs of uh, terns in Dublin Bay. And what you would have heard there are mostly common terns, but there are a small number of Arctic terns in, in the port as well that are breeding in the port. Okay, so this is the common tern. Um, the common tern is quite a. Sorry. This is a common tern. So the common tern has a black and it has this orange bill with a black tip and it's short tail streamers. So I don't know if you can see it there, but the little white bits coming out, those are the tail streamers. And then these are the tail, these are the wings. And it has um, long orange red legs. So this species overwinters um, between Western and Southern Africa and it breeds across Eurasia and North America. So it is a circumpolar breeding distribution, meaning basically it breeds all across, um, it breeds all the way around the globe, but on the, the northern side, the northern part. Um, what's really lovely about the common terns name is that it means sea swallow. So basically common terns have this nickname sea swallow and it's because they have this really beautiful buoyant flight. But if you look at their Latin name, is saying here. If you look at their Latin name, it's Sterna Horundo, and Sterna means swallow or or San Martin House Martin, and sorry, Sterna means Sterna Horundo, which basically means sea swallow. Um, the second species that we have in Dublin Port is the Arctic Tern, and the Arctic Tern is one of the most beautiful birds, in my opinion. And um, it has this dark red bill. Um, during the breeding season, and during the breeding season again, it has this black cap. It has greyish underparts and short legs and has white tail streamers that extend beyond the wingtips. These short legs, when it's standing, they give it kind of a dumpier appearance than the common tern, which looks a little bit taller and up off the ground, whereas the Arctic tern looks just that little bit closer to the ground. Um, again, the Arctic tern breeds across most of Eurasia and North America, um, but it Breeds like it breeds much closer to uh, breeds much higher up in the Arctic Circle than the common tern can. Ireland is at the southern limit of the Arctic tern's breeding range, and it's considered much more sight faithful than common than the common tern. So when the Arctic tern is with us here in Ireland, it's actually off wintering off the coast of Antarctica, which is absolutely incredible. Bird that weighs about hundred grams, and it makes the longest migration of any species in the world. Um, the distance it migrates, just to put it into context, uh, the distance it migrates over its lifetime is equivalent to three to four round trips to the moon, which is just nuts. So in Dublin Port, we've been ringing these birds um, over the last number of years. Um, so again, it's just these little rings here. We just use one on the turns, one colouring on the turns. Um, and these colourings are throwing up some really interesting results. Um, it's showing us that common terns, as it's proven that the common terns that are up here in Dublin Bay with us during the summer are overwintering off the coast of Western and Southwestern Africa, which is really lovely. And this is a photograph of a common tern during the, break, during the winter that was photographed off the coast of Senegal. So this bird here, is all the way from here to down around here. Okay, so there are, as I was saying before, there are a number of challenges that come with um, Dublin Bay's kind of proximity to a capital city and to Dublin Port. There are also benefits, as Ricky was pointing out, there's, there's no hunting on the islands and the birds are safer from that kind of thing, but there are some challenges. Um, so the port represents one of the challenges. It's really good for the terns in that the, it provides them with safe breeding, it provides them with breeding space. But also a port is a very, very busy place. Um, you've got a lot of ships coming in and out. You've got a lot of noise pollution associated with that. And around these ships, there's a lot of birds, such as the terns, who are like diving into the sea and there's a ship just down the way from them or other seabirds doing the same. Or you have wading birds like these sanderling and gunnan here who are foraging along the shore and boats are coming in along past them or they're trying to roost, rest up 
along the shore and being disturbed. So we don't know what kind of compromises birds are having to make on a day-to-day -day basis because of the activity in the port. To compound this, there's 1.5 million people sitting right on top of the bay. So all of the nature in all of the wildlife in Dublin Bay is having to coexist with quite a lot of activity and this leads to a lot of disturbances in the bay. Um, and when we think of disturbances, when we see like a dog or a person um, disturbing birds, are typically our attitudes are they're birds, they can fly somewhere else, but they can, but they're still ecologically tied. They're still tied to that place. And also every time they have to get up and move, it wastes energy. It uses up energy that they should have been using for feeding or for roosting. So it's really important basically just to keep our distance from these birds. Um, and just there's been some challenges and um, there's been kind of a few losses that have come from disturbance. Um, so on North Pole Island, there used to be a population of hares on the island and these have now gone extinct. We've also lost the little tern colony from North Pole Island as well. Um, so it used to be up at the northern tip of the island. Um, and because of disturbance, again, they just couldn't successfully raise any young. And the grey seal population um, on, on Bull Island, again, is considered under threat because of disturbances, particularly from dogs. So these are just some of the impacts that um, kind of being in an urban environment has had on wildlife in, in the bay. Um, so dogs off lead is kind of one of the leading causes, is, is actually the leading cause of disturbance in the bay um, and one that needs to be monitored. Um, so this is just a quick video of two actually really lovely dogs, but, um, and they're just running through, but they're running through a flock. So basically the take home message from today is if we just give wildlife a little bit of space, just keep our distance from a bit, we'll give it a chance to flourish. We are, we are so lucky to have this incredible ecosystem right on our doorstep, but we do need to protect it for future generations. And we can do that by essentially just keeping our distance from birds, um, from the wild, and not just birds, the, the wildlife that is in the bay and giving it space. Um, and that's it. So thank you very much for listening. Um, and uh, any questions? And I'll stop sharing now. <laughs> Tara, thank you so much. Um, I've been looking at the uh, chat and there's been a huge number of um, positive comments. Um, such an informative presentation. Um, you know, a lot of people have taken an awful lot away from this and I'm delighted that we have the opportunity, opportunity to share that again. Um, you know, through social media channels, that's one of our questions, is this going to be available? And absolutely, yes, it will. We'll, we'll be posting this up um, and sharing where that can be found via our social media channels. Now, there's Ricky again. Yeah. Um, he looks like he's enjoying himself an awful lot, far too much. Now, unfortunately, I I um, I lost connection halfway through um, and had to re-log, so it was all fun for me. Um, but uh, we're going to try and answer a few of the questions now. Um, I'm going to go straight to um, a question here from Gavin Rothwell, and it covers the last point, Tara, that you were talking about, and it's about that um, disturbance. Um, so, uh, so Gavin, you say, um, thanks for organising this. Uh, my question, is this being done to protect Bull Island from further, oh, sorry, what is being done to protect Bull Island from further serious biodiversity decline? In the last few years, the island has lost some of some key breeding species, including the hare, little tern and ring plover, etc., all due to habitat disturbance. Um, it's a really a, a tricky one and obviously it's a known problem. Um, we, we're managing biospheres that people can enjoy them, that they, that they can get out there and they can connect with nature. Um, but obviously we have to manage it so that we're protecting that habitat. And certainly the service is a, is a an issue and um, the dogs is a is a particularly big one. Um, there has been studies on um, on North Pole Island in particular but as far as I'm concerned I, I, I'm looking at the whole of the biosphere but I'm going to focus on North Pole Island because that's what you're referencing here. Um, there have been studies uh, on North Pole Island to look at um, you know the issue and maybe what we can do to manage and protect it. Um, so one of the studies that was conducted by Eco Aaron 
uh, were, came up with a number of um, approaches and one was to just a, a zoning approach. Um, so the idea would be to have um, no access to the very northern part where the seals are and certainly the, uh, some of the more important um, uh, bird species. Um, that dogs should be on leash um, in the dunes, but to have an area where dogs can be uh, uh, allowed to, to be uh, off leash, um, and that would be the southern end of North Bull Island. Now, you know, this is kind of a compromise. Um, it's, it's not ideal, but it certainly uh, it's, uh, would be considered by most to be a step in the right direction. And um, we know that um, people who own dogs are generally, not always, um, but are generally a dog lovers. So it's getting that message out there um, and ha getting people to realise that, um, you know, when um, the red setters start chasing after birds, it's not having a game. It's uh, actually quite serious in that instance. So we've got work to do and we have plans to um, target this particular issue. I mean, this webinar is part of that pro process, um, but we are looking at producing um, a, a short video that will highlight the issues and, and, and explain uh, in simple terms to the community um, how we can better um, engage with our local wildlife. Um, there's talk of having um, improved signage um, on North Bell Island to, to uh, raise awareness of that um, and if the visitor centre um, happens, which I'm sure it will, uh, hopefully it will, um, there'll be an opportunity to engage with uh, the public um, in a more meaningful way to get over those messages. So it's happening um, and I, I, I know it's not happening fast enough for some people but it's it's in hand um, and I hope that kind of answers your question to some degree um, and if it doesn't please come back to me and um, you know we'll, we, we, we can have a discussion on that. Now there's a load of other questions that have come through. <laughs> there is a load Dina, just one that sort of follows up on what you're just talking about there right. is um, Kyle has asked, is there a recommended safe distance for observing or times of the year to give birds more space that maybe it's better at a certain time of year to, to be watching them and then leave them in peace at other times? Ricky, maybe you could answer that one. How far are you away? <laughs> yeah, there's not. I'm not aware of a, of a sort of prescribed distance. Depends on the situation, depends on the species, some will tolerate everything. The, there's a deeply sort of ingrained, um, I suppose, genetic response for animals to, or, uh, you know, birds to flee from dogs. So they will, they will scare from dogs much, much easier than they will from humans. Um, and again, it depends where you are. So you see all along the, the, the sea wall, along Clontarf and stuff, the birds will happily feed below and you can literally um, be a foot away from them in distance, but maybe 10 foot above them or whatever, and they, they just go about their business. Um, so really there is no, you kind of have to gauge it yourself and um, the closer you want to get, um, you only need to get as close as, as you need to get. Um, and we would say never go on any of the vulnerable habitats anyway. Um, so if you can do it from the road or from the sort of allocated VPs, the viewpoints and, and stuff, that's the way to, to do it, you know. Um, in You know, you can really, I mean, I didn't demonstrate it well today, but the spectacle when the, when the, when the low tide is here and you're on the the, 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 the bridge here or anywhere on the on the road here in Bull Island, you can see 10, 15, 20 thousand uh, water birds swirling around and in their flocks and stuff. You really don't need to go any closer. The spectacle is brilliant. Um, but the, the short answer is no. There's no kind of 5 metres, 10 metres, 20 metres. Thanks. Thanks, Ricky. Just to follow up on that there while we have you, um, is there a difference? You just mentioned the, the tide and the flats. Someone has asked, is there a difference viewing the flats while the tide is rising versus when it's falling? When's, when's the best time to get out there to see the birds? Yeah, um, falling is probably more relaxed because the birds, like for example now, the birds are all squished up, roosting up onto the salt marsh um, and they're, 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 getting, they're getting some shut eye before they can feed again when the tide drops. So they'll be nice and relaxed when they're becoming feed because they're, they're not chasing the tide, they're following a dropping tide, so there's no big rush. Um, so I suppose a falling tide is quite a good time if you can catch it in the middle of the day where you've plenty of light and the light's not fading on you. But uh, if it's sort of coming to late evening and it's a rising tide, you're, you're rushing against the clock, you know. So um, try time it that way, that, that low tide is in the middle of the day and you'll have plenty of opportunity then, I think, is, is, is a good, 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 good chance. 
which is why we had the presentation at this time today. So, yeah, <laughs> so you can be out there in capturing that element. Fantastic. Um, there's a question there from Elizabeth. Uh, we missed the total population of Brent geese um, in and around Dublin Bay. The Isle of Man has up to 110 in a small bay. How many did we have? Do you, do you know those numbers? Um, I don't know them offhand, but I can find them. So oh. if that's any good. I can probably. Um, can you just, sorry, I, go on. Helen, you're sorry. all right. Can you hear me there? Yeah. Um, I can probably uh, answer that one. There is about, in and around, I don't know the definite figure, um, of course, but in Ireland, there's in and around 40,000 um, of the population of light bellied Brent geese that breed in the North Can East Canadian Arctic. So there, there, that's the population that come to Ireland. And as Tara said earlier, it's almost the entire um, number of individuals from that population that come to Ireland. So about 40,000 all around the coast. Um, but in Dublin, obviously, we have Dublin Bay, we've Baldoyle Bay, we've Rogerstown Estuary, we've Broadmeadow. Um, there's loads of, loads of food for them, loads of opportunities for them, but it's hard to put a handle on exactly how many. Uh, when we do our censuses, we do dawn censuses um, so that we can make sure that we're counting the birds before they leave the bay. So we're getting them just when they're kind of coming to in the morning before they've had a chance to leave, if they're choosing to leave to go and forage inland. And we often get in the region of about 5,000 geese in Dublin Bay. But then, of course, there is Baldoyle Bay, which really, on the face of it, when you look at a map, it's only, a, a, you know, a, a few hundred metres really skip over, you know, over Hoth into Baldoyle Bay. Um, and there could be another couple of thousand roosting there and, and they do move around a bit. So it's hard to put an exact figure on, on the birds in Dublin Bay. But all I can say is that um, we count in the region of about 5,000, but across the few estuaries in, in Dublin, there could be, you know, 15,000 um, geese. I'm sure um, some of the folk from the Irish Brenkers Research Group yeah. might have even more detailed information on that. They've done some great work with GPS um, devices looking at foraging areas and so on. But yeah, Dublin is a critical area for, for that population of the, of the Canadian um, pale belly Brent. Thank you, Helen. Appreciate that. Um, just to add to that, and uh, sort of linking the two biospheres, the two Irish ones, um, the Strangford Lock um, is where the Brents sort of arrive first and are really well studied there. And then they move sort of slowly south along the east coast and down. So we'd see them in Dublin before you'd see them in any numbers down in Kerry, but certainly to get them in Kerry in good numbers too, uh, sort of a couple of weeks later maybe. Um, so there's always great excitement when they arrive and... Uh, you know, tweets and, and, and various texts going around when the first flocks begin to arrive. So it's good. And uh, yeah. Yeah, Ricky, just on that, I, I just want to, um, there was a, a message in the chat there with Anna Rogers, who's um, listening in. Um, and Anna's doing some research for a film that's going to be um, uh, covering the Brent geese. And it's aimed at young people, um, uh, primarily um, seven to 11 ish year olds. And the, the movie, the film's going to be called Where the Wild Geese Go. Um, and she's actually in Dublin Bay at the moment and um, uh, capturing uh, information, uh, taking interviews and whatnot else. So that'll be really interesting to really learn a little bit more. And they'll actually be following them from um, the high Arctic to, to Dublin and, and back again. So that's, that's fascinating. Now, Marion Harris has just said, um, please say hello to the Bidens, of course. Um, and they're very welcome back in Ireland and we'd love to see them back in Mayo. And um, actually, we'd love to see your biosphere in Mayo, but that's for another day. Um, so, <laughs> Marion. And, and Marion has also actually also pointed out that um, Dublin Bay uh, isn't the only uh, capital city um, with a biosphere in Europe. Um, so, <laughs> have to say that we'd like to be unique uh, but we're not quite uh, but we are quite rare um, and obviously very special uh, so thanks very much for that Marion Harris next question how do you catch the birds to mark them who wants to take that how do you catch them any of us could probably take that one but um <laughs> there was there was a video in an earlier presentation that must have got got dropped out but um there's a couple of techniques, but the, the best, most effective and safest uh, version is a thing called cannon netting. And it's uh, quite an ominous name, but it does involve shooting um, a net from a pair of cannons over a flock of roosting birds. And um, 
you might find footage online, but it's, uh, it's all done under license and there's very few people that actually have the experience and the skills yeah. to operate um, cannon nets. So we, we actually rely on a small, a very small group of, of guys um, to do that. So every couple of years um, we round up the troops, we get the tags and we get everything we need. And we, um, from our studies and from the loads of reccees, we find a nice safe spot to do it, a suitable tide, suitable weather. Uh, and everything, and we um, we set up and hopefully catch some birds. And um, I suppose eight times out of ten, you don't catch anything, and uh, because the tide or the birds or the flocks go against you, and really the size of the net, even though it's huge, um, it's like a postal stamp when you put it out on 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 the, the salt marsh. Yes. So um, that's how you do it. And once you have the net over the birds, you then cover it up to keep them calm. You extract them one by one, and you keep them in a thing called a cloche which is a little uh, fabric kind of um, uh, fabric sort of uh, tents almost. And um, you process them then one by one, you put under little rings and um, get the measurements and the biometrics you need and, and release them. And it's all done very safe and scientifically. It's, um, that's how it's done. So anyone that's interested, um, they, they, they Google that and you, you'll find some footage. Well, well Ricky, uh, we can go one better. Um, we've actually got some footage <laughs> on our website. Um, and on our Facebook page, um, of uh, with a short video um, taken of just that with Brent Geese in um, in Dublin Bay, and it shows the cannon net and it shows the uh, tagging and it shows the release. Um, so yeah, it's 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 fascinating how, how it's done. Um, I was imagining um, the uh, old cartoons Catch the Pigeon back in the day, but you know that's kind of my age. Um, good stuff. Now we're moving on. So, um, so Deirdre, I uh, missed the beginning of the presentation due to work, but are there guillemots on the South Pearl Wall and do they go into the old foghorns of the Poolbeg Lighthouse? Uh, yes, well, there's, there's black guillemots. Well, you'll see guillemots and black guillemots around the Great South Wall. Um, certainly, if you're walking the wall, looking on the liffy side of it, you'll frequently see them diving in the water and you'll very frequently also see, uh, particularly close to the summertime and during summer, um, black guillemots on the wall itself. And yes, I have seen them flying into, I'm not sure if that's, uh, if it's the same exact hole that we're, ta we're talking about here, um, the, the foghorn, but certainly on the red lighthouse at the end of the Great South Wall, I have, I have seen black guillemots flying in there for sure, yeah. Okay, very good. Um, so the next question is from um, Marion Harris. Uh, uh, so Marion said, um, Birdwatch Ireland are doing the first comprehensive survey of ground nesting birds at North Bull Island 2020-2021 um, for Dublin City Council. Um, we apply success with funding under the National Biodiversity Action Plan. So it's not a question, but it's just a statement. Um, so there's a comprehensive uh, survey being done on ground nesting birds there on North Bull Island. Um, so that's good to know. Uh, so that one's been done. Guidance. Uh, a, a question here we've already had, which was, "What's your favourite bird?" I think we covered that earlier. Uh, Helen, you didn't answer. Did Did you have your, your own favourite bird there? My own favourite bird. Yeah. Um, my own favourite bird. I have to say, I always jump straight to Sanderling. Um, <laughs> it's one of the ones I think Tara showed in the presentation there with the that the dogs were disturbing. But they're such beautiful birds, and if anyone wants to go and have a look at them. Um, the, they're always on the tide line, so you'll see them just skipping, as Tara said earlier, skipping in and out of the, the waves. So the waves are kind of churning up invertebrates and so on in the sand. Um, but they're like little clockwork mice, and they're yeah. very, very pale in colour, and they're absolutely beautiful little birds. So Dolly Mount Strand or, um, or the tide line along um, uh, Sandy Mount as well. But actually at high tide, a really good place to see them and people walk by them all the time and don't even notice them is when you're walking the Great South Wall at a high tide when all of the sand flats are covered and they now no, have nowhere to feed they roost in flocks on, along the rock armament of the Great South Wall itself so they could be literally one foot away from walkers and joggers on the wall and people just don't think to look onto the rocks so so that's a good tip at high tide during the winter to look out for sandling they're really white in colour and they're gorgeous little waders. Fantastic. That answers the next question from Emma um, Shannon as well, which was, um, what's your favourite place to watch birds? Um, so, fantastic. In, in Kerry, Eleanor, is there a really good place to watch birds in, in, in Kerry? You're muted. <laughs> I'm mute. <laughs> uh, down in Kerry, well, I'm really lucky. I actually live just outside the Biosphere area, very close to Derry National Park. 
and we have amazing sand dunes um, and sand mud flats here as well. So that's where I'd go to watch birds and it's within my 5k which is fantastic so I've been totally spoiled. <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> Very good. Um, so this is a strange, strange one um, from uh, Shane O'Doherty, who who um, runs Shane's Health Adventures, and is a, a great supporter of the Dublin Bay Biosphere, one of our um, adventure tourism operators. So his question is: Do the porpoise follow the gannet, or does the gannet follow the porpoise? Come on, <laughs> there's a few laughs going on in Ricky's car there. <laughs> That's like what came first, the chicken or the yeah, egg? chicken or the egg? Is it? Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I think Shane is just being funny, but I reckon it probably. Uh, I think they 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 they'd probably swap sometimes. I think the porpoise would be quite happy if the gannet indicated where the fish ball was, or vice versa. So um, maybe we'll throw it back at Shane to find out for our next <laughs> webinar. We'll, we'll put the pressure on him to. I know, sure. I know when we're out, um, if, if we're ever out trying to find porpoise or dolphins or anything like that out in, in a bay anywhere, we always look for the birds first. So for humans, it's easier to spot the birds first and follow them to, to where they're feeding and you're likely to see the porpoise or dolphins in that area then. So now this is going to be going to you guys again, uh, Birdwatch Island. Um, are rats still a predatory problem for birds breeding sites in the port area? Uh, yes, <laughs> uh, but Tara definitely knows uh, knows an awful lot about this. She's done a, a lot of glamorous work with rats, um, so Tara, do step in if I'm getting anything anything wrong here. But yeah, in the summertime, with them, um, our work with Birdwatch Ireland and the Dublin Bay Birds Project, we monitor the tern colonies in in Dublin Port. So there's four different man-made platforms that the birds nest on. Um, and every year we find evidence that rats have managed to get out to these um, to get out to these platforms. Rats are are very good swimmers, so I didn't realise how good. I thought they might just be able to cover you know a few feet or a few metres, but it turns out they can cover quite a distance. Um, so we're lucky enough that they haven't made it out to. There's a platform that the terns nest on. It's a pontoon the Dublin Port Company. Um, arranged and deployed out there and look after and it's fantastic because it now has I think maybe I can't, I can't think now the final figure but about 250 pairs of common terns nesting on it in the summer just gone but thankfully even though that's quite close well about it's about 150 meters from from the great south wall where I presume there probably are lots of rats lurking underneath the rock armament but so far they haven't made it out to that pontoon which we're delighted about but there is, um, there is the other, I think they've, the rats have definitely made it out to, to all of the other um, structures that they nest on. So it's, uh, it is a problem and it's a hard one to solve. Um, it's something that we're always talking about. There's different things you can do, like putting kind of baffles on the chains that are holding the platforms down to prevent the rats from climbing up and things like making the chains slippy. But rats seem to... Um, they're excellent at finding ways around these things, but certainly it's something that we're trying really hard to um, trying really hard to prevent because once they get onto a platform, they just kind of go hell for leather with the uh, the chicks and eggs and so on. So it is a problem. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Um, so so we, when we started with eight nine eight or nine questions, when we finished the presentation, we're now up to twenty two. Um, so we're going to try and get through that. <laughs> um, so this is an interesting one. Do shags dry their feathers the same way as cormorants do? Ricky's coming in. Yeah, nice short answer, yes. Yes, fantastic. Okay, I like the short answers. <laughs> um, so uh, we've got... Uh, da, da, da. What are the merits, uh, if any, of making a bridge break in the Bull Island Causeway to permit tidal flow? I, I, do you, would you know? I don't know the answer. Yeah, not sure I understand the question. There was um, the causeway. So when I had when I was sharing my screen um, earlier, the um, probably show you now. So way out there in the distance, um, I don't know if you can see the chevron. That's the causeway up there. So it marks the sort of halfway point between the the wooden bridge and uh, so it, what we call South Lagoon is between the causeway and this bridge and then there's another lagoon, North Lagoon as Tara described, between there and Sutton should we say or Holt uh, sort of head where that starts. Um, there was, ba back in the day that was, it was breached, it was designed for the for the tide to flow through it and it just silted up over time and um, 
it was just it was grand so the tide the tide just escaped either end of the island so it was left that way it was never it never corrected and um, it seems to work fine and the habitats haven't suffered or anything so I think everyone's happy to leave it that way so I don't know if the person asking the question knows more than that or has has reason to believe that isn't the case and um, but certainly from a bird's point of view um, it hasn't been on our radar that it's it is a problem in any way Great. okay thanks very much for that um, so uh... What is the trend in Brent geese numbers? There seem fewer this year, as what's been suggested. But um, I, for, from what I'm aware, uh, over the last number of years, Brent geese numbers have actually increased slightly. But would you have good stats? Yeah, I think generally Brent are one of the success stories. There are species that come from um, for the for the west, the, well, the northeast Canadian Arctic, but west, west of Ireland, and some of the species coming from that the, that area west northwest of Ireland seem to be doing better than some of the ones coming from the east um, for reasons, some that are known and some that are unknown. But um, the Brent themselves generally have, have been on a, 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 a sort of increasing trend. There's years when they maybe have a poor breeding year and then things might level out and so on. Um, I don't know huge detail from, from year to year, maybe of the, of the international population, but overall since, you know, over the last kind of 10, 20 years, it's, it's been an increasing trend. And, when people say they haven't seen as many, I, I presume right, they, they, it's, it's probably someone in, in Dublin, is it saying that? Um, uh, I wouldn't say there's fewer in Dublin now. I think they're, they, you know, they spread out a lot and, and sometimes we can do a count in a bay one month and we might find 5,000 Brent geese. And then the following month, even though it's midwinter when you would expect to see peak numbers, we might only count two or 300. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they're not there. It just means that they could be inland feeding on some of the parks and playing mm -hmm. pitches, which is something that they do yeah. regularly. So it's, it's quite hard to get a, get a handle on, on the numbers at, at any one time, but overall an increasing trend, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, Joe there from the Isle of Man, they're, they're already thinking about the next webinar series, by the way. Um, so if anyone has any ideas, um, now I think it's going to be Eleanor, you're going to be next uh, in the Kerry Biosphere uh, for, for next month um, and the Isle of Man the month after. But if anyone has any ideas, um, what you'd like to know and learn about the Biosphere, that's, uh, that's really good. Uh, yeah, we'd love to hear from you and, and take th those ideas on board. Um, so another question here from Bernard. Um, what about the broad meadows between swords and malahide? How significant is it for bird species? Would you know? Uh, yeah, uh, broad meadow or malahide estuary um, with the train line run running across it there, kind of separating the inner from the outer. It's, yeah, it's, it has internationally important numbers of, um, of several water bird species. Um, I'm straining now to think of exactly all the detail, but certainly uh, blacktail godwits. Um, it's a site where large flocks of golden plover are frequently recorded. Um, so it's yeah, it is. It, it's um, it, it's a, a very important site. Yeah, I think all of the Dublin estuaries, actually, including Rogerstown, Baldoyle, Dublin Bay, they're they're all really really important for wintering water birds. Great, great. Thank you for that. Um, so this is this is a, a, a an interesting question. So oyster catchers uh, are seen flocking on football pitches. Would they be feeding on earthworms? What are they after on the football pitches? Um, yeah, they should be feeding on earthworms out there. Yeah. Um, so you, yeah, you'll see them feeding alongside curlew as well and uh, the blacktail godwit and the brent geese. Um, so the brent are looking for grass, but the rest of them are looking for earthworms and other kind of insects and invertebrates. Fantastic. Nice, quick, easy one. Um, so we've got uh, Councillor Cooney here. Uh, what is the best way to protect the nesting ground birds on Bull Island and getting the new management plan quickly written and enacted? Um, so the, the, the Bull Island management plan is is ready to go and I, uh, I believe there, there's some sort of consultation process that's happening um, but what is the best way to protect the ground nesting birds what are your thoughts guys uh, the best way and uh, the best way is to cut all access to the island uh, but that's not going to happen no. <laughs> and so I mean that horse has bolted and obviously it's so important for for recreation and all that sort of stuff so zoning zoning is a very good um, you know, middle ground maybe. Um, it's a good suggestion. I don't know. I mean, can't say. It's, it has to be discussed. But really, um, if you could, 
if you could restrict access or um, stop the disturbance and uh, take all the predators out of the situation, you'd have you'd have a perfect situation. But that's that's just not possible. Um, in this sort of in the modern climate, um, it's just not. But that's that is the answer. Yeah. 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 I mean, biospheres are managed for people and nature. And by having that connection, as we found this year in particular, um, people appreciate um, nature more, you know, there's having that connection. So there are benefits to it. Um, and I think the zoning option that has been already uh, discussed um, would make the most sense and, and really raising the awareness of what issues are caused by uh, the disturbance because like i say most of our um, dog owners are animal lovers um, so we just need to to get the message out there and um and you know hopefully get the right response um so where can uh just renata sorry. find the ringed plover in dublin bay Um, so you get ring plover down um, on North Bull Island there where Ricky is and um, you also get them down on Sandy Mount Strand. So down around Marion Gates, um, it's in between Bruderstown Marsh and kind of it's down around Bruderstown um, train station down around there you get them there as well. Um, and you'll also get um, you also get them on the beach the odd time on Dolly Mount Strand. They'd be easier to see on Dolly Mount Strand than Sandy Mount Strand because Dolly Mount Strand is a lot thinner then Sandy Mount Strand. Sandy Mount Strand is like this huge sand flat and the tide line is so far away and that's where the ring plover would be, would be up at the tide line along with all the sanderling that Helen was mentioning and Dullin and stuff. So yeah, it's a uh, Dolly Mount Strand, North Bull Island, the South Lagoon, down near the wooden bridge where Ricky was and um, down Marion Gates on Sandy Mount Strand, but it's kind of where there's a like a grassy area down there. You'll find them. Okay. I'll add a caveat though, not, not the easiest species to connect with, definitely not, of all the things we've mentioned, um, it's one of the trickier ones. Okay, uh, so uh, Kyle's asking a question here, um, uh, does the urban environment have more positive or negative effect compared to estuaries with less urban influence? Eleanor, did you want to? No. Any ideas? Again, I could only give an opinion. I think, um, yeah. I think that insulation um, the, the the capital city gives it from from certain predators and activities and stuff is, is probably quite a, a, a useful thing. But equally, measured that against the, the pressures that it creates, it, it's I don't know on balance. I think it's probably a negative. Um, yeah. yeah. So yeah, it'd be difficult to say, but um, yeah. Well, no, it's only that it's probably a negative. Um, Tim's Tim's question is: Is it illegal to photograph nesting birds without a special license? Yeah, that's an easy one. Yeah, it's a, it's illegal. Yeah, totally. And um, yeah, no, it is. You need a license. Very good. Um, so, when the Brents and Godwits move to Parkland, do they continue to feed on grasses? Um, so the Brent are feeding on grasses, but the, the Godwits, they're feeding, and it's a black-tail Godwit specifically, it's feeding on the worms. The worms. Did it? Yeah. And Fantastic. other insects. Okay. Okay. Good stuff. Uh, now we're running out of time. <laughs> See if we can get through a few quick ones here. Um, has there been any noticeable drop in the population with the development of Baldoyle Racecourse and all the green belts surrounding the estuary? That's not a quick one, is it? <laughs> Noticeable drop in, in what, sorry? Uh, uh, bird populations, I would imagine. It's, in relation to the development around that valve yeah, oil? Yeah. Uh, no idea. A quick answer. Um, hard, hard one to monitor. So I, I wouldn't, that's something you'd have to do a very specific study on. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. No, I wouldn't, wouldn't have yeah. an answer for that. Okay. Uh, so where are we going? How long does the ill grass uh, feast last for the Brent before they have to move off to playing fields? That's a really good question. So they have their... their uh, um, feast and when that's gone how long is it before that's gone yeah there's no specific answer probably it depends on the size of the flock that arrives into Dublin and how long and how long it takes them to find the, the, the beds and just just to forage on it so it's gone when it's gone really um, and then they just head off inland like you say so it, it's, it's it's it depends now unfortunately we've run out of time uh, 
Look, I mean, the number of questions and the, the, the interesting questions has just go to, you know, proved, um, you know, what a fascinating, interesting subject this is. Um, now, if you have any other questions that are, that are absolutely burning, um, you know, maybe you could direct them to myself at info at Dublin Bay Biosphere.ie um, or to um, the guys there at Birdwatch Ireland. I'm sure you have a, a, a general email. Would you have a general email that people can contact you at? Yeah, sure. You can send anything to info at birdwatchireland.ie. Fantastic. Or to um, any one of our email addresses or Whelan for Ricky, H. Boland for me and T. Adcock for, for Tara. And Dean, just to say thanks so much for thank you. inviting us to, to do this webinar on behalf of my, myself and um, Tara and Ricky. It's really nice and really heartening to see so many people participating and logging in and, and watching it to see such good interest in birds it's, it's really lovely yeah, so thank the, you there really is yeah, no thank you no, no listen thank you i'm just going to share screen because i want to uh, I, I just want to um highlight uh, this is part of a, a tri biosphere webinar series there are going to be more biospheres and we are going to be sharing details of forthcoming biospheres on uh, social media um, it's important to thank um the isle of man biosphere the Kerry biospheres for their their support um in this and and uh, their efforts uh, to put the next set of uh, uh, biosphere webinars are on. Um, the Department of Culture, Heritage and Gale Talk and the MPWS in particular for their support. Um, uh, Dublin Port for the support of, of Birdwatch Ireland. Birdwatch Ireland are way above and beyond, thank you so much. Um, and then obviously the other uh, participants in the um, Dublin Bay Biosphere Partnership, uh, Dublin City Council, Dunleary, Rathen County Council, Fingal County Council uh, and Fulch Ireland. Guys, everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I, I hope you found it as informative as I have done and I can't wait for the next one um, and hopefully you'll join us then. So. Um, thank you so much and thank you Birdwatch Island for such a fantastic presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you.